Hello, my name is Amanda Colapelle, and welcome to Derma Dry Segments. On today's episode, I am joined by Dr. Amy Shaw. She is double board certified medical doctor and wellness expert. Thank you very much for having us today. Thanks so much for having me, Amanda. So excited. So are we. Um, so before we begin, we're going to go through the questions a little bit about your journey and also hyperhidrosis. Great. How did you first get into inter integrative medicine, wellness, and tr nutrition? Tell us a little bit about your journey. Amanda, it was because of my personal crisis that I got into it. Um, as a physician, I did nutrition as an undergraduate. Then I went to medical school, but I never learned how to take care of myself and how to keep myself healthy um, beyond the office visit. Um, so when I got in my crisis, where I had fatigue and um, joint pains and bloating and just couldn't think straight and my mood was awful and I was anxious, I was having nightmares every night, I think I knew I had to make a change. But I didn't know how to because I was busy in my life. There was no extra time. Mm -hmm. So one day about 10 years ago now, I had a life-threatening car accident on my way home from a late meeting, trying to pick up my kids. And if you know any parent can relate that feeling of being late for a pickup for your children, but then you're also drawn uh, by your work. Um, and I knew after that day, after the car was completely totaled around me and I was so lucky to get my life back, mm -hmm. that it was time for me to make a change in my career, in the things that I studied and the things that I talked about. I needed to live the life the way I had um, always imagined and I needed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So while I was fixing myself, I started to teach about it and talk about it. All the research that I was doing, I started to share it. And here we are um, about 10 years later and wellness and integrative medicine is a huge part of my practice. Now I still practice some clinical medicine, uh, but a lot of my practices, wellness and education and integrated medicine. Wow, thank you very much for sharing that. And I think right now, that's what we need. Um, wellness in every sense, physical and mental. And we're really grateful that you also take care of that and you're able to teach your patients and other individuals about that. Yeah, it was a long, painful journey, but I think I have a lot to share. Yeah. What is your wellness philosophy? My wellness philosophy is that instead of always getting input from the external world, we have to start to tune in to our internal world and to the natural signals. So the signals coming in from inside our body, the signals of sunlight and darkness, and start tuning out the artificial signals, the signals of the email, the um, social media, the, uh, the news segment, um, and all of those inputs, caffeine, alcohol, all of those inputs that are drowning out our own body. Um, so wellness philosophy is to tune more inwards rather than outwards. That's actually really well put. <laughs> Um, what was your first experience with hyperhidrosis, either learning about it or actually diagnosing a patient? This is funny because when I first started to um, learn about dermadry and hyperhidrosis, I remember learning about it in medical school, but it was such a small um, topic um, and something that was part of a uh, you know very, very large, um, subject and we barely spent more than maybe five minutes on it and then I saw actually it was a family friend who came to me for help and he said that it was very embarrassing for him that he had hyperhidrosis of his palms and when it, he was going for interviews um, he would have to shake people's hands and you know pre-covid um shaking hands is a part of every single interaction in business and education um in sales and everything mm -hmm. and it was significantly affecting his life his confidence uh people would tease him about it um and he didn't feel comfortable really talking to his own physician about it he came to me as a friend physician 
And then I read the stats that, you know, up to, I think they said like 40% of people do not talk to their physicians about this problem, even though the prevalence is between one and 13% mm -hmm. in the world. These people, it's very embarrassing. It affects uh, the quality of life. Um, and most physicians, frankly, are not educated mm -hmm. enough on this topic to be able to give them solutions. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, all of month of November 2020 is dedicated for Hyperhidrosis Awareness Month. And this is why we're trying our best to really just put that out there and educate people, not just the ones that are, who are suffering from hyperhidrosis, but also those that who don't know, do not know about the condition. To also be aware, um, there's a lot of them that suffer from anxieties and you know, we want to be aware of that so we know how to respond as well. Absolutely. Um, going into that topic, actually, how has hyperhidrosis research, like, evolved throughout the years, especially even with your patients? You know, this is a great question. I think that there are such limited options for hyperhidrosis and, um, there's very little research uh, that comes to the forefront with this. Um, some of the solutions don't work. Um, many of the solutions are quite expensive. And most of the solutions are not accessible by the patient themselves. So unless they go to see a specialist and then unless they get the specialist to prescribe this um, a, a procedure or a treatment, um, they're kind of powerless. And so that's why I was so excited to see that there was an FDA approved um, treatment that a patient could buy themselves and try themselves. It's so empowering to be able to do something that is medically sound, mm -hmm. but that the patient does not need to disclose to multiple layers of people mm -hmm. to be able to treat. I think that was the biggest breakthrough to me about this um, technology is that it's safe, it's effective, it's FDA approved, and that the patient does not have to have any um, interaction or um, does not have to feel the anxiety or the stress of going through multiple layers of practitioners um, to obtain this. And that's also what we're trying to get into. Even when it comes to um, diagnosing hyperhidrosis, a lot of patients don't know. A lot of uh, medical, in the medical field, sometimes it's not, it's overlooked. So that's why it's really important what we want to get into when it comes to um, diagnosing hyperhidrosis. So leading into that question, how do dermatologists diagnose hyperhidrosis or how do you do it? That's a great question. So, um, you know, there's not a lot of practitioners who do this test, but there is a gold standard test um, called the sweat test. Um, and this test is able to diagnose um, primary hyperhidrosis um, pretty well. Mm -hmm. One of the main tests that people use is the sweat test where you use starch and iodine mixture and the areas of that turn blue are um, signs of hyperhidrosis. Um, so this is a test that people can get at their specialist office, um, but you don't necessarily need the test to know if you have it. Mm -hmm. uh, people sometimes think that they need to be diagnosed to be able to find solutions, uh, but I think that if you're someone who is suffering with hyperhidrosis, if it's something that's significantly impacting your life, uh, there's no real downside to trying a solution like this. That is perfectly well said. Um, going into the taboo subject, um, excessive sweating is regarded as a, because people do not feel comfortable talking about it. Uh, even with their patients or with their doctors or with their friends and family. Um, how does a patient usually approach you to this topic? That's a great question, Amanda. Most of the time they don't. Um, and as you know, uh, you know, 
almost half of patients don't approach their physician. Uh, sometimes it ends up being uh, something that's revealed uh, when talking about something else, maybe talking about confidence or talking about um, finding secondary causes. So some people will say, um, I think I'm sweating um, more than I should be. I'm, I'm trying to look for a cause and often we'll search for some secondary um, causes for this, um, be it medications, be it um, thyroid or hormonal issues um, and various other things. And if the workup is negative, then we consider that primary hyperhidrosis. And what would be secondary? Secondary is um, from a medication, from a treatment, from a, a medical problem that is separate from um, this condition that causes excessive sweating. Um, so there's a number of conditions that cause you to have an excess of sweating, and that would be considered secondary hyperhidrosis. Okay. Yeah, that's what a lot of our patients also talk to us about. Some of them are from medication. Some of them are hereditary. So it really depends. It's really case by case. Um, also, a lot of your work focuses on health and inflammation. Why do you think that this is an often overlooked aspect of our health? Great question. Inflammation, honestly, is your immune system uh, being active. So immune system being active sounds like a good thing, right? So yes, inflammation is a good thing. If you have an ankle that you twisted today on your way to work, you want that inflammation there to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with inflammation and, uh, and, and too active immune system is if it's chronically active in every, uh, many, many different parts of your body. You don't want to have chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. You want the inflammation to come in, fix the problem, and leave. Mm -hmm. You don't want the immune system to have a low-grade activation. So how I explain this to people is, if you're eating something, for example, that's foreign to the body, your gut bacteria will tell the immune system, hey, there's something foreign here. I want you to come check it out. Mm -hmm. And your immune system goes and checks it out, and that's considered inflammation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're constantly eating processed foods, terrible foods, medications, uh, dyes, um, your immune system is constantly being contacted. Mm -hmm. And that is inflammation. Our body is not supposed to be in constant inflammation mode. It's supposed to fix the problem and then settle down. And so this is why I think it's so important to change your diet, change the way you live. You don't want to be calling the troops for every little thing that happens in your body. You want some of it to kind of work smoothly. And how does it work smoothly? With whole foods, with sunlight, with good rest, with exercise, um, and the very you know things we know that make our body run better. Um, inflammation happens when we're eating poorly, we're eat, uh, taking in substances that are foreign, um, alcohol, and stress, really. And that's actually a perfect segment to my next question. Um, there are the mental and physical symptoms. So beyond the physical symptoms of hyperhidrosis, how can excessive sweating affect patients mentally, socially, professionally, et cetera? What are the common things that you see or hear? Amanda, exactly the, uh, the example I gave you when I first heard about it. Mm -hmm. My patient and friend had lowered confidence, mm -hmm. had more anxiety, had stopped himself from taking opportunities mm -hmm. because of his fear of someone um, commenting or feeling grossed out or um, you know questioning his health status so he would be so hesitant to shake hands with someone new he uh, was anxious about it he would think about it for hours before the actual interview instead of thinking about the interview itself and um and then he would apologize constantly when people would come up to him and congratulate him for something or he would say i'm so sorry about my hands and it's it's think about the impact that has on someone's psyche um i think that was the most that's the most 
sad and concerning part of this. And linking back, one of the owners of Dermadry, the, one of the founders on how the product came about was one of the reasons he has severe hyperhidrosis and he was such in fear of shaking hands with people. Um, even like for a job interview or even just casually in social setting, it was so difficult for him to do so. So now that there are treatments out there can actually help that. So it's really cool how yeah. things have progressed. Yes, very exciting. Yeah. Do you believe that diet plays a role in hyperhidrosis, as we mentioned kind of before? I think diet plays a role in everything. Mm -hmm. Diet is our biggest mover in health. Mm -hmm. I think that if you eat a low inflammation, high vegetable and plant fiber diet, mm -hmm. you can improve every part of your body. That's my belief. So going into that, for example, if someone eats spicy foods or sugars or processed foods, does that actually increase or impact your sweating levels in any way? That absolutely does. Um, you know, spicy foods, processed foods, sweet foods, um, unhealthy trans fat foods, they all can worsen the condition for people who are dealing with this problem, yes. And what would you suggest to eat or to lay off on um, when it comes to eating habits and hyperhidrosis? That's a great idea, a question. I would encourage a increase of whole fresh foods, vegetables and fruits and fibrous um, foods and taking out some of those spicy, processed, sweet um, and unhealthy foods out of the diet to improve the condition. That's actually really informative. And how about when you were explaining about alcohol? What do you recommend is the perfect dose, if we want to say, um, on a weekly basis for someone that is suffering hyperhidrosis? Alcohol is a double-edged sword, right? Because there are many anti-inflammatory benefits, as we know with red wine in the studies of um, the Mediterranean countries. However, it can quickly escalate into a negative dose uh, value. So I say three drinks for women a week and five drinks for men a week is the absolute um, maximum that I recommend for people uh, with or without hyperhidrosis. Usually people say one glass of wine a day. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's really crazy because a moderate um, alcohol consumption mm -hmm is really interpreted so loosely, um, meaning that, so three to five drinks for women and five to seven drinks for men. So man, the max you should be having is one drink a day. And a woman, it should be just one drink a day, few days a week, three to five days a week, so. Is there yeah. a reason why? Because they find that there's real anti-inflammatory benefits for um, from drinking. However, what they found is that the people who are on the, uh, on the extremes, like someone who's drinking a lot um, and someone who's not drinking at all, um, there's a big difference. So the people who are drinking a lot have um, negative outcomes. Um, and the people who aren't drinking at all aren't getting negative, but they're not really getting the benefits of alcohol. There's this very small, sweet middle spot um, that here in the modern world, we often miss uh, because we are so used to having drinks with dinner or drinks at a social event and it's very very easy to go over the three to five drinks a week for women for sure mm -hmm. that's super interesting and also the fact that even caffeine could play a role in that that's something yes. that a lot of people didn't know about before so percent yeah caffeine can definitely exacerbate it as well wow for those who sweat excessively are they a in a higher risk range when it comes to minerals or vitamins? Do they have deficiencies or more deficiencies? That's a great question. Our body is really good at managing our um, sodium potassium balance. And so we can sweat and pee and um, lose many, many electrolytes without much of a problem as long as we're eating and drinking adequately. 
Um, now, if you are in an environment that is quite hot um, and you have hyperhidrosis, that is something that I would be concerned about. Okay. So what, what would be some foods or nutrients that would actually be able to help hyperhidrosis? In, in the setting of sweating or just in general? In the setting of sweating. Yes, so in the setting of sweating, you always have to worry about um, sodium loss and potassium loss. Uh, there's many, many drinks that are electrolyte based that can help you replete your electrolytes. You can buy an electrolyte water. You can, um, for a lot of people who have this problem if they're exercising outdoors, there's special tablets that you can take, electrolyte tablets that you can take along with water to make sure that you're able to keep your electrolytes up. Now, remember that our sweat is not just water. It's made out of electrolytes. And so when we are sweating, we are constantly losing those electrolytes. And so if you are um, suffering with hyperhidrosis and you are exercising or it's very hot, um, you have to make sure that you're not only adequately hydrating, but also repleting your electrolytes. That's actually a really good point. Um, I was actually speaking to um, one patient a few weeks back and they were actually bringing that up and saying how thirsty they were. And yeah. they didn't understand if it was linked with the hyperhidrosis. Um, yeah. but studies do show that it is linked. Yes, 100%. Switching gears a little bit, um, what would be the effects of aluminum salts in traditional antiperspirants? It's been very debated for a very long time. Do you think they are harmful for the body? That's a loaded question. Um, and I'll tell you this. Okay. I'm a physician and I read all the science. Mm -hmm. Yet I don't use traditional deodorant myself. Now, I'm not telling you that we have definitive science that argues against it. Most people believe that the dose is so small that um, no one should worry about it. However, personally, I chose not to because of the fact that in my mind, um, unless I you know, was convinced that there was no problem with it, I was not going to use it. So I guess, Amanda, how I would say is a personal decision. There is no right or wrong answer. Um, I think the jury's still out. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of even, like a lot of back and forth when it comes yeah. to that topic. And we were yeah. just interested to know on what your thoughts were on it. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, I wouldn't, you know, I never want to be a fear monger and I never want to tell the whole world who's using these products to stop. But I do think that you should do your own research. And, you know, like I said, I chose to not use them. What would your thoughts be on tap water iontophoresis, such as Dermadry, as a treatment option for hyperhidrosis, getting away now from the antiperspirants and other treatments? Amanda, I am so excited about um, tap water antiphoresis. I think it is something that can change lives. And I'm very, that's why I'm so excited um, to be talking about things like Dermadry and treatments that use iontophoresis because it's a safe and effective um, FDA approved way. I think the reason why I keep emphasizing FDA approved um, to people is that there's a lot that goes into approval. Um, and we don't approve things very easily anymore. It has to go through many, many layers of processes. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited that we can offer people in a treatment that they can do at home. Mm -hmm. And that's effective uh, and easy. And actually linking to that question, um, because it is an at-home treatment, we really recommend for the patients to have an, a treatment schedule. Um, and we believe that it does play a role on increasing self-esteem and self-confidence. And research has shown that. What are your thoughts? 100%. I agree that, you, you know, you have to be on a regular treatment schedule to really see a difference. And I think that keeping up, just like we do with any health habit, um, having something become a habit and re be regular 
has a huge effect on not only giving us results, but also giving us a sense of routine and increasing our confidence and lowering the anxiety. That's exactly what we are, our goal is. And yeah. that's why we try and always try and maintain that three to five times a week. Um, and then you could get up to six weeks of dryness. And there's yeah. also some people that have used it at a perfect consistency. Um, and they actually have two to three months of dryness, which is, and it relieves them a lot. What a great, uh, I mean, honestly, I have to say to have an at home solution that is simple and easy. I mean, it's as simple as watching the YouTube video, watch, reading the simple instructions, you know, tap water um, is all you really need in a plug. And um, you could be doing this uh, three to five times a week pretty easily while doing something else, watching a show mm-hmm. and, um, really changing your life in a very significant way. Yes, exactly. And speaking about it, speaking about sweat in general, um, do you think that there are factors such as age and sex that actually play a role in how somebody sweats? Absolutely. Um, Gender and um, hormones, sex hormones, um, definitely have a uh, a play in um, how much you sweat and age uh, definitely as well. Um, We see that testosterone, for example, that are found mostly in men or more in men, um, tends to increase um, sweating. Mm -hmm. And um, this is why, you know, a lot of the men have issues with hyperhidrosis. They have it in um, certain areas of the body, whereas women um, tend to have it in other areas of their body. That's actually a lot of studies have shown that and also with age, um, people tend to believe that just because you're an elder, yeah. you might not have hyperhidrosis, which is not necessarily the case. 100%. You know, a lot of people choose Botox as a treatment uh, for hyperhidrosis. And the problem is it's painful, it's expensive, it wears off quite um, immediately, and it requires multiple visits um, to a medical practitioner. And therefore, I personally would really prefer to send patients um, home with this kind of item where they can do it themselves. And if they need additional treatments on top of that, that's fine. It can be additive, but maybe they can just manage it on their own at home in a safe and uh, easy way. And less expensive. (laughs) (laughs) Much less expensive. Yeah. And that's actually one of the reasons that a lot of patients also choose derma dry they they feel like the product does work but however it is a cheaper option for them and that is easier to use and they enjoy it being at home using the treatment yes research has shown that certain countries particularly asian countries have a higher prevalence of hyperhidrosis why do you think this might be a reason that's a great question, Amanda. I think that genetics plays a role in hyperhidrosis, um, of course. And we know that people with different genetics around the world have varying rates of all different conditions. And so it's not surprising to me that um, your genetic predisposition will change your risk. Mm-hmm. Um, beyond that, could it be because Um, There is so much heat and humidity in those places. Uh, Perhaps that plays a role, but I do think a lot of this is genetics. There was also a study that we have seen um, that this study actually shown that in certain countries, for example, Asia, um, sometimes when it comes to even shaking the hand, um, if you are sweating, sometimes you might not be able to get the job. Sometimes right. it's overlooked and it's sometimes it could be a, a problem. Yes. And it's a, you know, it's like you said, you know, in the world of handshakes, um, hyperhidrosis not only becomes um, an uncomfortable secret, it becomes a secret that you share with each person that you interact with. And it can be quite embarrassing if you're not ready to share that information. That's very true. And there's also another type of hyperhidrosis that is kind of unspoken for. 
Um, it's basically for the face, the head, and scalp area, which is called craniofacial hyperhidrosis. And this is actually troubling because it's not an area that you can you can actually hide. And we want to know what you think about this condition and what you would recommend for your patients that do have craniofacial hyperhidrosis. This kind of hyperhidrosis is maybe the most embarrassing because you cannot hide it with clothes. You cannot wipe your hands on a towel. Like, you know, you know that there's many patients with hyperhidrosis who carry towels with them at all times. Mm -hmm. So right before they're needing to shake hands or whatever they can, or they'll change their shirt. Mm -hmm. But with um, craniofacial, you cannot hide it. It is there. Um, if you're a female, it's extremely distressing because of hair and makeup. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it really ruins every single aspect of a new meeting if you have this problem. Um, so I really do feel for the mental, uh, emotional aspects of this. And that's such also a taboo topic that people yeah. don't like to speak about. And yeah, we're trying to find solutions on how we could help the people that do suffer from that condition. What are some useful tips that you can share for those who are suffering with hyperhidrosis? If you're suffering from hyperhidrosis, don't be embarrassed. There are many thousands of people just like you. As we talked about, the incidence is between five and 14%. Mm -hmm. There are so many more people um, that have it that uh, don't even talk about it. So make sure you feel you know that you're not alone. Make sure that you talk to someone, a provider, a physician, um, that you feel comfortable with. Please, the only way you can get help and improve this condition is by talking about it. And the other thing is to know that there are solutions. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big um, misnomers is that you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, a lot of people feel helpless. And to know that there's a solution like tap water iontophoresis, um, you know, and various other solutions to this problem, it should empower you to go and seek this out, talk to someone you trust about it, see what your options are, and choose an option. You don't have to live like this. And that's actually what we're trying to do and our goal is, especially during Hyperhidrosis Month. We really want to spread the word and, and let people know that it's okay that other people are also feeling that way or thinking this way. And then us speaking about it, we actually have stories that are coming in and letting us know like, hey, this is actually how I'm feeling. And also getting yeah. your point of view, I think that would be even calming for them at the same time. Yeah, I agree. Any final thoughts you would like to share on your experience with hyperhidrosis patients or your journey in wellness? Biggest thing is don't be afraid to share. Uh, I think the biggest wellness journey that I've had is that you don't have to keep your struggles inside. In fact, the more I talked about my personal struggles with health, um, the more I was able to find that there were so many other people who were suffering like me. And the more we were able to share solutions with each other. Mm -hmm. And so someone who's suffering with hyperhidrosis um, and any other medical problem make sure that you go ahead and share. And I understand not everybody feels comfortable sharing on social media. Uh, you don't have to do it that way. You can find a group that you feel comfortable with, online, offline, a person you feel comfortable talking to, a provider. Um, but I think that talking about your issues is in a wonderful way, not only to find solutions, but to also feel fulfilled and happy inside. Yes, and that's actually one of the programs that we were also trying to incorporate. We had programs such as Voices of Hyperhidrosis where people are actually able to speak openly or even they could we could hide their name on telling their story to so letting other people know. And the same thing we did for... Um, we did a school scholarship for them to actually video video record their experience or how they live their day-to-day -day life with hyperhidrosis and we got amazing feedback and it's 
really amazing and astonishing to see the stories that they have and for us to actually share those with the community or even like you said like little community groups i feel like that's really important for them to have a safe space for them to actually say their story and say hey this is what i have do you feel the same so i think that's a really important aspect to have yeah that is great very wonderful work that you're doing Thank you very much for having us today. It was a pleasure speaking with you. And we're very excited to get to the next Derma Dry segments. Have a good one. Thank you.